You know by now that we're all about the journey. June's journey, that is. Like, I feel this game was made for us specifically. It's the closest I've come to feeling like I've been dropped in the middle of a mystery novel set in the 1920s. That's because you get to play as June, a globe-trotting flapper slash amateur sleuth who lives to solve mysteries. You get to visit all sorts of fascinating places, from Paris to Cuba. You beat levels by identifying hidden objects in the scene. And we found that the more we play, the sharper our observational skills become. The game is delightful and a wonderful way to relax. I'll often pull my phone out and play it when I've got a free moment, like I'm on hold with an archive or I'm waiting for a courthouse to open up in the morning. I'm currently on Chapter 16, meaning I'm searching for the son of June's housekeeper, who's on the run from New Orleans gamblers and the police. It's a wild time. We know our audience is filled with folks who love a good mystery. Now is your chance to try your hand at being a sleuth yourself. Discover your inner detective when you download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder and violence. So on September 15th, 2021, a man named Bob Adair drove out to fix his mailbox in Brown County, Indiana. What might seem like a somewhat routine task turned into something very tragic and horrific when Adair's neighbor, Randy Small, came up and shot him in the head with a shotgun, killing him. So So now, a couple of years later, it's time to figure out what that incident was. Was it an act of self-defense by Randy Small, or was it an act of murder? Uh, As we've said, uh, Randy Small is on trial this week. We decided to check in on a couple of days of it because Randy Small is represented by none other than uh, Andy Baldwin, who, of course, is a defense attorney for Richard Allen. The state, in this case, is represented by Brown County, Indiana prosecutor Ted Adams, who is a longtime friend and associate of Baldwin's. So it's like seeing two friends who know each other's moves going up against each other. So it just sounded interesting to us. Absolutely. And the case itself is somewhat interesting. You have this really intense act of violence and trying to get to the bottom of what would prompt somebody to do that. Is there any possible justification or is this just cold-blooded murder? is is always interesting. We've been in Brown County this week. In our previous episode, we covered the jury selection. Today, we'll be talking about the opening statements and the first few witnesses. And then what we'll do probably later on is once there's a verdict, we'll check back in and talk about how things went. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're the Murder Sheet. And this is Andy Baldwin for the Defense, Randy Small and the Murder of Bob Adair. Opening Statements. As you mentioned before, I think one of the interesting things about this case is that there really isn't any dispute about the big picture of what happened. In other words, it's agreed that Randy Small fired a shotgun blast at the head of Bob Adair and that this blast killed him and, in fact, removed most of this man's head. The only question is, was it murder? Was it self-defense? Absolutely. And and so that's where that's where the defense comes in. Uh, that's where 
the criminal defense team comes in. Of course, this is Andy Baldwin's firm. He's accompanied by Kelly Pyle, his co-counsel on this case. And they're going to be trying to set up a narrative where they will try to convince the jury Randy Small was in fear for his life, and that was a reasonable fear. And meanwhile, Prosecutor Ted Adams is going to try to say, no, this was murder. And so the way things work in these cases, when uh, there's opening statements, the prosecution gets to go first, and there's a reason for that. And that's because the prosecution has the harder job. The prosecution is the side that actually has to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. They have to convince the jury of something. And if they fail to do that, they lose. The defense has no such obligation. All the defense has to do is try to raise doubts or poke holes in the case presented by the prosecution. So since the prosecution has the harder job, they get to go first. Absolutely. I think that's a really important distinction because I think a lot of people think, okay, the defense is trying to prove that their client didn't do it or they did it, but it was for a justifiable reason. And that typically, practically speaking, is the case. They're trying to put together a narrative. They're trying to sell a story. But at the same time, they don't have to. And the burden has to be on the prosecutor. The the prosecutor has to get over that hurdle. That's just the way things are under the system. And the prosecutor also has the benefit of having the power of law enforcement and massive investigative resources at their side as they're going through this. So the morning began uh, with Ted Adams giving an opening statement. Before we go into that, uh, I'd like to say, over, I, I think he did a great job. Oh, yeah, he did. A, I mean, yeah, he, he basically Adams put together an opening statement that was a vivid, shocking recounting of the aftermath of this act, sort of reminding the jury that, like, the result of all of this is that a man who was unarmed and driving out to fix the mailbox that his neighbor tore down was shot in the head to the degree that his head was essentially removed from his body and exploded. And just kind of driving home that like, this is not, you know, like that is a just driving home that that's just such a horrific fate. You talk about some of his vivid uh, descriptions and the things he uh, focuses on. He talked about saying that a picture is worth a thousand words, and he describes a moment frozen in time. What kind of details did he tell us about that moment? He talked about the tools that Bob Adair was carrying, so making it clear that his purpose was just to go fix his mailbox. Uh, As a side note, Randy Small and Bob Adair had been quarreling over the placement of the mailbox and over the fact that some extraneous building materials may have been left by Bob Adair in a field belonging to Randy Small. So definitely annoying neighborly things, but I think everyone can agree not worth somebody dying over. Um, And so he's making it clear that he's a craftsman. He's trying to fix stuff. He talks about how his cane was under some cement. I mean, he's an older man. He's, you know, not, he has a bad back. He's not a young spry person who's running around and can, you know, fight somebody off. And he especially focuses on the fact that when Bob Adair is shot and killed, his hands are folded in his lap. His hands are folded in his lap and her, his feet are pressed on the brake of the car and the brake lights are actually illuminated. And so why does he focus on that? Well, the self-defense claim that, you know, he was reaching for a gun, you know, if his hand's in his pocket or he's reaching for the glove compartment, then that might be more compelling. But basically what Ted Adams is saying is he's sitting there with his hands clasped. He's not reaching for anything. You know, what What exactly was Randy Small afraid of? And The other element of self-defense, when you have somebody in a vehicle, that's obviously a weapon in and of itself. They can run somebody down with that. But his feet are on the brakes. And and Ted Adams stresses in this opening, you know, scientists, you know, the people we're having from the forensic team, the scientists we're having testify, say that no meaningful movement can occur after death. 
So it's not like he was doing something and then then he clasped his hands. It's like that's that's how he was when he died. Yes. Adams is arguing that it's not like he was reaching for a gun. He gets shot in the head and he says, oh, I better make a good case for S- Small having killed yes. me. Death so is instantaneous. Uh, and, and also uh, Adams raised an interesting point which relates over and above this case to other cases in the area, which, frankly, I wasn't even aware of. Uh, He called it the phone game. And by this, uh, I suppose we should explain a little bit more about Brown County, Indiana. It's an area with lots of hills, uh, I guess, valleys or or hollers. It has lots of uh, trees. And so because of this, as you drive around Brown County, you often have spots where you have no cell phone reception, I guess no radio reception. We experienced that ourselves when we were driving um, from Brown County. We were on the phone with a friend and suddenly the call drops like and and we try calling again it, it it won't connect so it's it's definitely a place where that is a factor even if you're just on the main roads so yeah and that was something that was like a little annoying for us but it's also actually an issue and i, I wasn't aware of this that affects uh, law enforcement in the area because this uh incident happened on uh, a road where for whatever reason there's virtually no cell phone reception no radio reception so a number of police officers get called to this scene, and once they're there, their ability to communicate with other police officers not present is extremely limited. Yeah, that was sort of a terrifying image. I mean, obviously, in this situation, there was a very tragic death of the uh, Bob Adair, but I, I mean, in a in a bigger disaster or something going on, that's kind of concerning, and I would hope that Brown County would be attempting to unroll some solutions for this, but basically they get up there to the kind of more remote gravel well, road. Exactly. Let, let me let me give a bit of context. Yeah. So basically this incident happens, I think, around like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Bob Adair is in a truck that's in a field on property belonging to uh, Randy Small. The confrontation occurs, and then Randy Small returns home he doesn't call the police or anything like that but at some point he calls some of his brothers and he tells them what happened and then uh about 10 hours after the shooting his brothers contact police in another city and say our brother in nashville is involved in this situation we're concerned he might actually kill himself and so this is what motivates the police to get out there and they arrive there i believe a little after midnight and and why don't you read out the actual list, like the actual telephone line, so to speak, that was going on here? His brothers, Randy Small's brothers, actually end up contacting Indiana State Police Troopers in Pendleton, Indiana, at that post. And those troopers tell their dispatch about the situation. And the Indiana State Police Dispatcher in Pendleton then contacts the the police dispatcher in Brown County. And the dispatcher in Brown County contacts uh, an officer named Mike Moore. And then it's Mike Moore who then tells the officers who are responding to the scene what's going on. So there's a long chain there of communication. So that's really not ideal, obviously. Yes. And this creates confusion at the scene. Because it wasn't until later, as I understand it, that Bob Adair's body was even found. I think there was confusion about, like, who was shot? Should we, like, who? Who are we looking for almost? Right. And also, meanwhile, uh, Randy Small has basically barricaded himself in his home. And there's uh, fears he might commit suicide or commit suicide by cop. After a great deal of effort, he's talked out of the house and police decide to take him to a hospital for some mental evaluation. And it's not until he's en route to the hospital that those uh, officers are ordered to stop this this ride to the hospital and place them under arrest because they've discovered a body. Yes. Uh, another thing that's worth mentioning is, as we've said, this all boils down to what was in Randy Small's mind when he decided to fire the shot that killed 
Bob Adair. And Prosecutor Adams says, well, you know, we have a way of looking into his mind because we have the body cam footage from the officers on the scene. And didn't he indicate some of the things? Yeah, it was actually the Indiana State Police Trooper's body cam footage, because essentially what Ted Adams described was that the troopers and Pendle- at the Pendleton Post had Randy's brothers call him and put it on speaker. So they they were standing there recording the entire conversation through their body cam setups. What kind of things did Randy s- say on this? This was basically Randy Small's response to finding out that his brothers told law enforcement that he'd shot Bob Adair or that he'd shot somebody. Man, I'm probably home free. Well, man, don't turn me in, dumbass. Well, fucking wonderful, man. I can't believe you blabbed me out. And the way that Ted Adams essentially summed these statements up was the the phrase consciousness of guilt. Can you speak to what that means, Kevin? A consciousness of guilt basically means that a person realizes he's done something wrong. If you're if you're talking like Randy Small is alleged to have talked on these recordings, you sound like a person who's trying to get away with something. Right. Home means, free. Which means you believe you've done something wrong. If, on the other hand, you have killed someone and you believe you did it as an act of self-defense and it was justified, perhaps you wouldn't be reacting that way. You would potentially call it in yourself, get help, or at the very least, when people were calling on your behalf, law enforcement, you would be not actively pissed off at them. Right. Uh, And before we leave Ted Adams' opening statement, I wanted to mention one thing he did, which I thought was kind of interesting, is he made a point of continuing to use the phrase that Robert Erdare's head was blown off. He kept on saying the head was blown off. He blew his head off. And I think that was trying to really hammer down to the jury what a horrifying and brutal act this is, at least the consequences of it. And in fact, at one point, Ted Adams says, this was the worst crime scene I've seen in my entire career. Yeah, so that's striking given that he's had a long career in criminal defense work and also being the prosecutor of this county. I think we all have an idea of what a headshot might look like, but it's usually the head is intact, and that was not the case here. Right. We are so delighted to work with our sponsor, Brilliant Earth. This is a company that offers some of the most brilliant and romantic engagement rings and wedding bands out there all the while ensuring a commitment to ethical sourcing and sustainability. If you're looking to get married or to become engaged, or even if you're just searching for a special piece of fine jewelry, you have to check out their website. They make browsing so easy. They even let you design your own perfect engagement ring, or you can shop by style. I love the delicate willow rings, along with the three stone Nadia rings and the classic Frisia rings. It's so hard to choose. And you don't have to worry about the ethical implications of your purchase. Your special gift, your engagement ring, your wedding band should never be tarnished by the idea that the gems or materials came from an abusive system. See, Brilliant Earth has a commitment to beyond conflict-free diamonds. That means one thing. They only accept diamonds from mining operations and countries that strictly follow international labor, trade, and environmental standards. Fewer than 1% of other diamond suppliers meet Brilliant Earth standards. You can feel good about your purchase, knowing that you're supporting a brand that actually cares about its ethical impact and is committed to fostering better standards in the jewelry business. Check out all of their beautiful pieces at BrilliantEarth.com. That's BrilliantEarth.com. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit for a reason. HelloFresh really wants you to have it all, free time and fresh, tasty food. That's why they take care of all the meal planning and deliver the ingredients so everything you need to whip up a delicious meal arrives right to your door. We love the convenience of getting high-quality, pre-measured ingredients shipped right to our door so we can have the fun of cooking meals together in the kitchen without the pressure of worrying about whether or not we have all the items we need. And let me stress that when we say high-quality ingredients, we really mean it. 
the last time I was in the grocery store, some of the produce I saw looked like it had been sitting out for weeks. And that is frustrating because this is the peak time for summer produce. Well, HelloFresh makes sure that their ingredients travel from the farm to your front door in less than seven days. And when something is that fresh, it simply tastes better. This is another great reason to try out HelloFresh. And remember, Murder Sheet listeners get a special discount. Go to HelloFresh.com slash MSheet50 and use code MSheet50 for 50% off plus free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash MSheet50 and use code MSheet50 for 50% off plus free shipping. Find out why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Now, if you remember back to our episode about voir dire and jury selection, Andy Baldwin made a point of asking the jury, don't make up your mind after you've heard the prosecution. Wait and listen to me. So he did get a chance to stand up and make an opening statement. And he actually began it by referring back to something Ted Adams had said. You know, Ted Adams said a picture is worth a thousand words. What Andy Baldwin said, well, what about a picture that is incomplete or false? He's basically saying the aftermath of this crime, this horrible image of this man with his head blown off, you know, that that may be what ended up happening. But we're going to be talking about things that maybe you can't photograph, like maybe justifiable fear Randy Small may have felt or, you know, whatever was happening immediately beforehand. And one of the ways is we'll get into that he's really going to stress of, of why we don't have maybe more images and evidence pointing to that is in his view, not because they don't exist, but because in law enforcement did a bad job investigating the case and being open minded about the possibility of a self-defense argument. If I understood him correctly, he was contending that the, the, the law enforcement investigators basically put in their report that. Bob Adair in his truck is stationary and Randy Small in a tractor approaches the stationary truck and fires. And I believe Baldwin was suggesting that's not how it happened. Actually, he contended that it was Randy Small who was stationary and it was the truck that was approaching him in an arguably threatening way. And that that's what caused this. But unfortunately, we don't have evidence of that because of an improper investigation. He indicated that, in fact, elements of the detective's report in this were just plain out false. He, at one point, did take some time to to say, I don't believe that the detective knowingly lied. I don't believe this was like a malicious or, you know, conspiratorial thing. I think they just got tunnel vision and basically made up their minds too early about what happened and then did not keep an open mind as they were looking at all the facts. And that prompted the investigation to be less thorough than it should have been. So he's saying that, like, I don't think it's like this is a bad guy who's trying to cover up or, you know, basically uh, gang up on my client, Randy Small, just more of like an inadvertent thing. Yeah, and he actually says, you can t- I, I can tell you the precise moment to the minute when police stopped looking at the whole picture because they believed they knew better. And he said that happened at 3.11 p.m. on September 16th, 2021, about 24 hours after the shooting. He said at that point, uh, the investigating detective filed a report indicating that it was the truck that was stationary while... Randy Small approached the truck. And he said, that's simply not true. And it was uh, a factual error. He he put this in his report because he said Randy Small's brother told him that's what happened. And actually, that's not what Randy Small's brother said. And that they have it on recording proving that. So, you know, I, I just think one thing it's very interesting with Baldwin's defense here is, you know, we may see something maybe not completely dissimilar in Delphi, with the Franks v. Delaware issues that have been sort of raised in the Delphi case, we don't really know what that entails at this point. But it basically is an indication that, along with his co-counsel, Brad Rosie, 
Andy Baldwin will be really looking into law enforcement's role within that and potentially trying to very much dig into mistakes, omissions, things like that. And so it definitely shows a willingness to very much tangle with law enforcement in the course of defending a client, which I imagine is not altogether uncommon. If you're a defense attorney, you're you're having to pick apart holes in the state's case. And that means really scrutinizing the work of law enforcement. But it's just interesting as we look at that strategy here to kind of think about what it might look like in other cases that we're also interested in. Exactly. Uh, I thought one thing that uh, Baldwin did in this opening statement that was interesting was he seemed to anticipate some of the questions the jurors might have about his version of events. Because I know one thing that was going on in my mind was, well, if Randy Small is just out on basically a pleasure ride on his tractor, why did he have the gun with him? Doesn't him having a gun suggest that maybe he intended to do something? And Baldwin made a point of saying in his opening that actually uh, Randy Small was well known for uh, not only talking a lot, but also for carrying a gun around all the time. And when he was out riding on his tractor, he'd often use the gun to shoot at rattlesnakes or other wild animals. Or varmints, as he called them. Yes. <laughs> Uh, copperheads so basically kind of indicating that that was not that was not like a necessarily a defensive mechanism by randy small more of just par for the course yes he also kind of narrowed down some of the timeline here because you may be wondering was there some sort of protracted fight or like what exactly happened but i don't i i know at least andy mentioned this i don't know if ted mentioned it too but there was a neighbor a witness who saw randy driving out on his sort of tractor little vehicle. I think it, it's like bushwhacking or something. Oh. Yeah, It's like pe people use it to kind of like, I think like clear land and he's holding a long gun. He, he drives out on that and then there's two gunshots. He drives back four or five minutes later. You know, she figures he shot a snake or something. She's not thinking, oh my God, he killed somebody. So um, it, it really happened in a pretty short span of time there. And uh, another point he made was uh, some of the at least implicit p points of Ted Adams' argument was that, you know, Small was showing consciousness of guilt by the way he acted. You know, he didn't go to the police. He didn't do this. He didn't do that. Uh, Baldwin argued, you know, actually, if he was guilty, maybe there are things he would have done differently. You know, if you're a guilty man and you just killed a man in a truck, maybe you try to dispose of the truck, or maybe you go home and pack up and just flee. And he says Randy Small didn't do those things. And so doesn't that suggest that he had no consciousness of guilt? He also referenced that the state was going to bring up a so-called jailhouse snitch. Yes. Which, of course, you know is kind of interesting in in the sense that he's basically saying that, you know, the, the jailhouse snitch, even though he may have been trying to angle for a deal with the prosecution, actually, this was his quote on it. I cannot wait for that to blow up in the state's face, basically indicating that the jailhouse snitch was actually going to introduce reasonable doubt. Obviously. I mean, I, I have a problem with jailhouse snitches in general, regardless of whose side they're on, because I think when you have people incentivized to tell certain stories, that's not always a great thing, especially when it's like as dire as like I could have be like get out of prison faster or jail faster. I could make a good plea deal. Like, you know, that's a pretty extreme thing to pressure somebody to potentially tell a story. But if there's recordings or something to back the person up, then obviously that becomes a little bit more interesting i think we don't we don't know exactly how that's gonna go we don't after andy baldwin finished his uh opening statement uh the first few witnesses were called do you want to quickly run through some of our impressions of that yeah so the first witness was actually bob adair's daughter and that was a really poignant situation she she got up she was very poised very calm and did a very good job speaking about what her father meant to her and you know just kind of seemed like a joyful interesting guy who was a buddhist had he, he was um he was an artisan he was a woodworker 
and, you know, just close with her dad. And it was really sad because at one point she's very, very poised. And then she just breaks down because she's talking about, like, how he called her, left a voicemail. And if she'd picked up, that would have been the last time she talked to him. But she didn't pick up and she really regrets that. And I just thought that was really sad. And, it, I mean, it, I I feel like, you know, just underscores the loss of this kind of really senseless tragedy. And it, it, that that moment made me kind of think back to what was happening during jury selection. Because you had uh, Kelly and Andy kind of being like, we're going to go after Baba Dare. And you have to be okay with that. And I understand that in a self-defense argument, you have to basically go after the dead person saying, my client thought that this guy was going to kill him. But, like, the man's 70 years old. He has a bad back. We've just established from his daughter that, you know, he's means a lot to certain people and, and they're devastated by his loss. And so I wonder if I wonder if that's Ted Adams anticipating that a little bit. And I also wonder if that could backfire, because, like, I think. I, I I mean, I'm sure I mean, Kelly and Andy have a lot of trial experience. I think they probably know how far to push. But at the same time, I think if you push too far on that line, it's like, well, the guy got his head blown off, you know, like, <laughs> like, you know, like character assassination post mortem, you know, it has to it has to serve a purpose. It has to serve the purpose of establishing that Randy Small could have indeed been afraid for his life. I think if it gets too far beyond that, that could seem just kind of mean. I'm not saying that's even rational. I'm just trying to think about it. Like if I were on the jury, her her statements were very moving, I thought. Uh, we then had a few law enforcement officers who were there that night. They described their uh, activities at the crime scene their interactions with Randy Small or their interactions uh, relevant to the case. The only officer who was subjected to cross-examination this morning was the officer who was basically in a situation where he was like relaying messages from other people, trying to get them to people in the field. And he had some interactions with Randy Small's brothers over the phone the cross-examination of him was basically, well, did you record these calls? And he said, I didn't record the calls. You know, I was I was driving. And uh, Andy Baldwin was saying, well, you, you could have pulled over because this was like a murder investigation. And I think the point Andy Baldwin was trying to make was that he wants to suggest that uh, Randy Small's brothers in these calls communicated the idea that Randy Small had acted in self-defense and that the police were not taking that seriously. Ted Adams referred to his name's Michael Moore, uh, called a middleman Michael Moore to kind of underscore his role as trying to be almost the communications hub for a very complicated and confusing night. Um, and I thought it, it, it helped that Adams established how remote that spot was and how problematic the radio and call situation was it explained it more and you know given that it's also more understandable when Moore, who at the time i believe was a brown county sheriff's deputy employee sort of had served in that role for a long time basically like it, they don't know what they're getting they know that there's maybe a report of someone being shot maybe a report of someone wanting to do suicide by cop it's not like they're responding to oh we found a body they're more of responding to randy small not bob adair We've gotten calls from sources in the car before, and we're two people. We're usually together when that happens. And it it can be difficult to, you know, if the person wants to start talking to you and wants you to record it, it can be difficult to make that happen when you're two people, let alone one person trying to do a lot. So I can understand it, but I can also stand from the, I can also understand why Andy's making a huge deal about it because it's like, you know, maybe kind of implying that it, it was sloppy or careless to not do that. And also that, uh, you know, that, that, that those facts about the possible self-defense were introduced early on. I don't really see how that makes like a huge difference, to be honest, um, in, in terms of like, because it, it it's either self-defense or it isn't. And I feel like that's going to be more of determined by like the scene itself and the evidence at the scene and like, what Randy Small ends up saying. 
basically they're trying to it, it goes towards the narrative of like the cops ignored the possibility i guess yeah i think that's what he's trying to do and baldwin is trying to say that even at this early stage they weren't taking a self-defense claim seriously and then uh just before lunch which is when we left there was a deputy on the stand deputy nick bryles he was the one that actually uh discovered the body of bob adair he sees uh uh, the, the pickup truck and he approaches it and looks in and he sees the body of a man who basically no longer has a head and a picture of that was actually displayed in the court and it was a pretty bloody and awful crime scene when the image of the body was showing i i i averted my eyes i was gonna look and i just i don't know i just didn't want to see it and there was really a deathly silence that kind of fell over everyone it's not that people have been talking or anything it just got really really quiet so I think that gave a sense of, you know, the jury seeing that and taking it in. And, you know, I, I know the defense in, in jury selection was very much like, you know, if he'd just been shot in the shoulder and killed that way or shot in the heart, it would still be he'd still be just as dead. But I have to imagine that. The brutality of it, that's at the very least, you know, going to be emotionally impactful. And I can't even imagine what Deputy Bryles was, like, thinking or, you know, I mean, like, you know, you're going, like, (laughs) I mean, I think it was dark out at that point, you know, that you see these, you see these brake lights illuminated in the darkness and you've heard, okay, there were reports that this guy we apprehended, Randy Small, may have, like, shot somebody, so let's look into this, and then you go up and you see that. I mean, God, just awful and it was uh a rather bizarre detail which is that apparently in brown county occasionally the dispatchers would ride along with some of the officers just to get uh, an idea of what it was like on the other side of things and so as it happened on this night there was a dispatcher riding along with uh, Deputy Bryles, and she certainly got more than she expected that night. I feel bad for her. Yeah, I can't even imagine. But she was able to help, actually, because she was able to sort of man the radio, I suppose, while, you know, the deputy was, like, out looking at stuff, and so kind of ended up doing some field work, I guess. I'd say before we go that Randy Small has has incredible attorneys in the criminal defense team. I think they're incredibly skilled experienced so i i still think that this is going to be a difficult situation based on the facts that have been discussed in court so far given that he didn't report it given that it he may have made disparaging comments to his brothers in that way and given the fact that basically evidence at the scene doesn't necessarily point to anything that should have made him fear for his life in a rational way. And so all of those things are hurdles. I don't think that it's a a slam dunk in the sense that there's no way that the jury could, you know, come back and say, actually, we do think it was self-defense. I think, you know, if the defense is able to prove that through evidence of their own and witnesses and establish that perhaps that that, you know, that should have been taken more seriously. And here's why I think, you know, there could be that result. But I also think that there seems to be a lot of evidence on the prosecution side. So it'll be something to watch and sort of see how it ends up going. But that's just my take on it so far. Yeah, it's a it's a tough case for the defense. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see if they are able to persuade some jurors to their point of view. And maybe this is unfair, but I think the moment you say, yes, he did it, you know, and and then you, and then the jury is shown the results of what he did, you know, it, it becomes kind of a situation where the jurors might be thinking, well, you know, what on earth could justify this? Like, you're really going to have to prove that self-defense angle because the results are so horrifying. 
And I think everybody is sympathetic to a self-defense strategy in the sense that, like, if somebody breaks into your house at night and you shoot them, you know, they were breaking into your house. Like, there, there, they, there were obviously people there. There could be no good reason for that. But when it, beco- what it, when it becomes tricky is, like, could there have been a situation to de-escalate, to walk away, to ride away, to just kind of say, listen... I'm going to sue you to get you to take your materials off my property. Like, like do so, work out the aggression some other way. So I think it's an uphill battle in a way for defense. But again, these are skilled defense attorneys. So I'll be really curious. And I'm sure they're going to put on a strong case in terms of, you know, to the best of their ability, presenting things from Randy Small's side and reminding the jury that he deserves a fair trial and he's a human being, even though he's accused of doing something pretty horrible. And uh, we're going to step away from the case now, but we'll keep an eye on it, and we will certainly let you know how it turns out. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening. Hello, Murder Sheet listeners. Thank you so much for sticking with us until the very end. Just wanted to take a moment as we close out to thank our sponsor, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. They are number one for a reason, folks. Kevin and I have been loving the meals we're getting from HelloFresh. We're talking farm fresh produce, protein, all sorts of customizable options to get you exactly what you and your family need. It's very delicious, it's very nutritious. And it's quite affordable. So it ticks off all our boxes. We've been very happy with the service. And, you know, would love for you guys to try it out if you're curious or if you've tried it out in the past and enjoyed it. You know, get that discount. It's HelloFresh.com slash MSheet16. And then you're going to plug in the code MSheet16. You get 16 free meals plus free shipping. You can't beat that. We've really been delighted by it. We work very hard on the podcast. It takes up a lot of time. It's our it's our small business. Um, we really enjoy the work. We enjoy conversing with all of you every week. Um, but at the same time, it's nice for Kevin and I to kind of have something to do outside of office hours. And uh, cooking these meals has been really fun. We're terrible in the kitchen, like disastrous. I mean, like I, I, I can tell you horror stories. You know, I, I mean, I, I probably shouldn't get into it on the podcast, but I mean, some pretty... Some pretty disastrous moments involving our cooking, <laughs> you know, n- nothing, nothing life threatening, but definitely stuff that we we tried to be overly ambitious about, and it either went horribly wrong or it ended up costing like way more than it should have because we didn't properly like think about ingredients and uh, we're not we're not gifted in in the realm of the kitchen, but HelloFresh makes us pretend like we are because everything is so pre-portioned and pre-planned and the instructions are super clear. So like, you're not going to mess it up if you're like us. And if you're, if you're good in the kitchen, then it's just, it's just less of a hassle and and you get everything that you need. You don't have to run out to the grocery store. So super nice. Um, Try it out. I've really enjoyed the meals that they've sent us so far. I can say that Kevin has too. I highlight that because Kevin is pretty picky when it comes to food. He does not he does not like everything. He has he has pretty strong specifications and preferences. 
very much cares about things like fresh produce and, and farm produce and things like that. So he's very picky. And I think the fact that he is really enjoying HelloFresh is a testament to the quality here because he's a stickler for that kind of thing. Um, and so if you are, I think you will enjoy it as well. And again, the uh, URL and promo code that'll get you a sweet discount is HelloFresh.com slash msheet16. That's M-S-H-E-E-T 16. And use code msheet16. You're going to get 16 free meals plus free shipping. We hope you enjoy it. And again, thank you so much. 